I'm really excited, of course, for every single talk here at .NET Com Focus on Xamarin, but truly for one of my best friends in the entire world. I stole him all the way from Wisconsin, and he's here now in the Pacific Northwest. One of my best friends in the world, Matt Sokup, the cheese curd king himself. I mean, he's here to give a great talk on mobile backends. Matt, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks, James. That's one thing I really miss about Wisconsin. They don't have here in the PNW that much it is the cheese curds. And maybe the next time I'll be talking a lot more about cheese curds in the app. But today we're going to be talking about some monkeys in our app. So today what I'm going to talk about, though, is stitching together a mobile back end. So as James said, my name is Matt Sokup. Um, Code Mill Matt is my Twitter handle. And during this session, hit up the .NET Conf hashtag on Twitter. Tag me, Code Mill Matt, as well. And we'll be able to answer some questions if you have any and get put on the screen, you'll get some plush monkeys sent to you as well. So I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Cloud means I like to talk about Azure. I love talking about mobile. And if you have any, any questions at all about either, contact me at aka.ms slash office dash hours, 30 minutes. We can sit down and talk about anything you want. Let's jump into it. There's a whole lot to cover. All right, so applications, mobile apps need a backend for a couple of different reasons. Resiliency. So everybody thinks, oh, resilient, the data centers are going down, there's a big earthquake in Seattle, which never happens in Wisconsin, but in Seattle might be a huge earthquake. I like to think of resiliency in a good sense. Your app makes so much, there's so many people hitting it that the servers go down. You want it to be resilient just in case it's so successful, or when it is so successful, you want it to keep on going. Also scalable, the flip side of resiliency, is that you want to be able to scale up super quickly to handle when things start getting heavy. So if you know there's going to be some special loads going on, you want to scale up, but you also want to be able to scale down so you don't have to pay too much to have it like in your own data center. You don't want to have a ton of servers going. So this back end, you want it to be also scalable. And flip side of that scalable coin, super duper fast. You want it fast all around the world as well. So you have people here in the US or in Europe or South America, wherever, you want it to be fast for those users. And then, especially for mobile apps, you want it to be synchronization. Nobody has one device anymore. You have a phone, you're gonna have a tablet. Pretty soon, everybody's gonna have a Surface Neo and Duo with four screens, not just two. So you're gonna wanna be have synchronized everywhere. So every app needs a back end. But there's really, there's a ton of moving pieces here. You have to consider authentication. How do you sign your users in? How do you sign them up? You have data. And now I'm not just talking like database data, but also data for images and things like that. Security, not necessarily your auth security, but locking down your resources to make sure like there's nobody getting into the back end of it, into the, the data center portion of your security. And also compute. Compute is kind of like thrown around, like what, what does compute mean? Compute, you think about is like your web APIs portion of compute. So how do all those fit together? Well, we're gonna stitch them together. We're gonna make all those work. First, we're gonna talk about Azure storage and wrap a CDN around it to make it super fast. Cosmos DB for our data. And it's also super fast because it's Cosmos is spread out across the world. Azure, AD, B2C. I love me some B2C. I chant it when I go to sleep at night. B2C, B2C, B2C. And Azure Functions. Azure Functions is super duper cheap and very, very nice to use. And then Azure Key Vault. I, Key Vault's this thing that actually is great for security and it's not hard for devs to use. Kind of stays out of your way but makes everything really secure. All right. So let's take a look at what we're starting with or what we're going to Azure eyes. I have this app here, the Monkey Finder app that we've been using a couple different times in the, in the uh, conference today. And it's nice and orange, looks like cheese, has monkeys, everybody's happy. And you go into it, you see, all right, we have a baboon, little where they are, Africa and Asia, how many there's left, and gives us a little description of it. This could all be hard-coded, but it's not. 
Actually, it is pulling down from GitHub, and everything is hard-coded, essentially. That's, well, it's a back end of some sorts, but we can do better. We can do totally better, and we're going to. So this is what we're up to. We are taking this app, which is pulling data from a bunch of JSON on GitHub, and we're going to Azureize it. We're going to make it so great. So here we go. We're up, we're up, and we're away. All right, so first thing I want to talk about is Azure Storage and CDNs, or Content Delivery Networks. First off, what is storage good for? It's good for your static data. You have images that you want to deliver to your apps, storage is great for it. Why? Because it's cheap. It's really cheap. We're talking pennies on the massive gigabytes. It's, it's the way to go. And it's great, it's great for the images that you want to put on or any other static content, blobs. Think about blobs for here, and it's really, really fast. And with the CDN, it is available worldwide. So let's see how we can really go ahead and start using that. So before, all our images were here. A lot of them were coming just from Wikimedia. So what I wanted to do is get those up into storage. So I already have a storage account created here. And then once I get that, I'm going to put everything into a container. So I'm going to open up the storage um, explorer. I have my blob containers and I have a photo in there too. So I've gone ahead and already uploaded all the photos there. So generally speaking, if you had a bunch to um, migrate over here, we do have like command line tools that can do it for you really, really quickly, but there's only like 10 here, so I did them <laughs> all by hand. But you can see them, they're, they're all right here. So we, we click on Henry, double click, and there we see Henry with the channel nine doll there. But everything is here and everything is great and good to go. But storage, my account here for storage is in the Western US. That's great for us here in Seattle, but for somebody in Europe it's, or in Asia, it's not that great. So what I want to do is wrap a CDN around it to make it even faster. And so one of the great things that Azure Storage does give us, I just typed in CDN here, and it pops up Azure CDN. So it's built right in the storage where I can just click on it. And I've already did it, but I can just do create give it a name and so on, new name, pick a pricing tier, and then the whatever uh, URL I want, and then it'll create a CDN endpoint for us. And that CDN endpoint, what that's gonna do is essentially it's gonna spread all those images out and put them on the edge, the Azure edge. And what that means, they get cached on various data centers around the world, so they're gonna be closer and faster to where your users are. So all that means then is our URLs are gonna now be foxcdn.azureedge.net. We would replace that in our JSON and then in our code, nothing changes at all. They just load up, they're the same for, um, in the images we just load them with a URL. So it's a seamless as far as our apps concern, but it's a nice little touch over on the Azure side to make our images load faster. It's really cheap to host and it's great. Now it's resilient. We don't have to worry about them any longer. All right, we did that demo. Next thing up is data and Cosmos DB is where I'm gonna put everything here. So instead of hosting it on GitHub, we're gonna put it more into a real database so we can actually modify it and play around with it. Um, first thing I want to let everybody know is that there is a free tier of Cosmos, free as in forever free tier that you get, and it's great for prototyping and very light production loads, but it's free forever, and that's what we're using here. Um, Cosmos, what we're going to also use is uh, the NoSQL portion of it. It's called DocumentDB, which is great for JSON, so which means my code is not going to have to change that much over on the Xamarin side of things because we're still using JSON. And what's cool about document DB is I can actually query it with SQL. That's pretty neat. Cosmos also has a really robust security system built in, both for as far as accessing data from a user perspective and also so it can get at various other portions. So like when 
let's say Azure Functions, which we'll get to, wants to access Cosmos, we can lock that down really tight so nobody else can get in. Has a great .NET SDK, which makes it really easy to use from Xamarin Apps, and it's also distributed worldwide. That way, again, we have multiple read points around the world. Wherever our users are, they can get at it. So we want to take a look next up at our Cosmos DB. So back into Azure, and I'm going to open up Cosmos here. And what I did is in my data explorer, I pretty much just copied over. I created a zoo database, a monkeys collection, and then the items here, I have really just the same thing as we did over on GitHub, name, location, details. I put those into a document with an ID and a partition key. Now, there's a reason behind my madness here, but this is what I did. Name, location, details, it's the same object that we were using over on GitHub, but it's now within this document object, this document class. And one other thing I want to call out is the image that's being pulled down. It is boxcdn.azureedge.net. So it's using my CDN as well. All right, cool. So what's next here? Why, why is this... Why do I have it in document for? Well, I'm going to go jump over to Visual Studio now. And in my empty document class. So what I have here is an empty document. It has this generic T, right? And so ID, partition key, and then I have this document, and it's of type T. Well, that's great because my of type then can be monkey. So what I'm able to do then is make my documents here essentially be reusable. So ID, document, and partition key, they're going to stay the same over and over again. But inside this document object, because it's JSON and it's very NoSQL, very malleable, I'm able to put whatever I want to within there, anything I want. And I'm going to. So right now I just have these monkeys over and over again. And so then when I want to read it, let's go over to my monkeys view model. I'm just going to new up a data client and say, get all items, monkey. It's going to call up over here. And then this is what my .NET SDK looks like. It's doc client, that create document query. It's getting an empty document saying, I want the empty document of type T, which is my monkey. And then this goes on, and it's just saying, all right, this is where I'm going to find it, database name, collection name, zoo, and monkeys, and as document query. And then I just loop through everything, grab it, and put it in. So what I'm saying here is this, this get all items that I put into my data service is completely generic across whatever I will put up in my Cosmos collection there. So that's, that's really neat, and then I made it really... I'm stitching together something that I'm hoping is very generic across everything. All right. So, I mean, that's getting the data. The getting the data is pretty, pretty straightforward. But what about security, right? I mean, you can't access Cosmos without um, putting, a, putting a connection string in there. And eventually, I'm going to want to be able to, let's say, go in here and maybe favorite a monkey. And that monkey is going to be my favorite, not everybody's favorite. And so I want that to be just for me. So how do I do that? Well, Cosmos has this great thing called partitions. And we saw that just before, and I kind of glazed over it, where I had a partition that said public user. Well, we're going to have partitions for each individual user as well. And so that's kind of one good way that we can split up data within Cosmos is by putting it into a partition. And you can do it public and per user, and what happens then when we want to load that data from Cosmos, we use tokens. And what's great about using the token is that you don't have to hard code the connection string to Cosmos into your app. Super nice. That way, when you're not hard coding it into your app, a bunch of great things happen, including you never have to worry about checking it in, pushing it up to 
GitHub. And then that all that craziness that goes along there. No app credentials at all in GitHub. No app credentials anywhere, actually, because everything is just a token that expires after a while. But where are all, all those tokens put? That's our next topic here, Azure Functions. So what are functions? Functions are the serverless paradigm that we have in Azure. So what serverless means is, well, obviously there's no server. And it also means that it's, you don't have to worry about any infrastructure. You don't have to worry about even the operating system. You're just running the smallest amount of code that you need to write to make something. So you're just writing these tiny little nuggets everywhere. And so what we can use these functions for is for a web API. We can build out a, essentially a REST service without having to build a full like .NET Core web API. We can just build individual things for it. They're super cheap. You're only gonna pay for it when they run. And they have these things called bindings. And what's really cool about the bindings is that they connect up to things like blob storage or table storage or even Cosmos DB. And by this having this connection to Cosmos DB when you're bound to it, the functions runtime is going to take care of newing up a Cosmos DB connection for you. And you just have to declaratively say, hey, I want to be connected to Cosmos DB. Functions are going to take care of everything else. You're really, you're cool to go. And that's what I mean when it plays nice with others. There's so many bindings, there's so many triggers. Functions really is integrated well within the Azure ecosystem. So let's take a look at functions and how we can make functions work to get us a token for the public user partitions. So we can get all these public user from Cosmos down to our app without having to have any credentials. All right, so I have my function over here in VS Code. And all I'm doing here is have, I have a function here called public broker. So what this public broker does is here's the binding. It says Cosmos DB. I'm going to take in saying what the database name is, the collection name. I do have a connection string here, but it's cool. And I'll tell you why it's cool in two settings here. And it's going to be a document client. So Cos or functions is going to take care of doing all that up for me and handling it. And then eventually what I'm going to do is say, I'm going to get a partition permission. And here it's going to say read. So what I'm saying here is I'm going down and creating a bunch of things that are Cosmos based, but it, what's going to come out of here is because I'm going after the public user one, I'm going to get a read only permission to Cosmos. It's going to return that token to me through the app. And then what happens when I initialize my token, I say, all right, get me an access token. My app then says, all right, when I initialize the Cosmos client on app, it goes out, hits that endpoint for the function, gets the token back and then it uses that token right here when it news up the client. So essentially all I'm doing is hitting this endpoint, getting the read-only partition for my public users, and it comes back to the document client, and that's all I can access because that token is only good for that particular partition. Cool. But like I said, I'm going to want to have more than just that. Right? I'm going to want to enter data myself and my identity. And that's where Azure AD B2C comes in. And B2C is identity as a service. Right? We let Azure handle all the hard stuff. We let them actually encrypt all the data, all the user's identity, have it up there. We let them do all the communication back and forth to all their identity providers and so on. It's identity as a service. We just have to worry about running our apps it's aimed at consumers, right? So when you think of Active Directory, usually it's enterprise-based. adb to c is consumer-based. You don't know who your users are beforehand. B2C lets them sign up for your app. 
They can even sign up with social accounts. So like Google, Google or Twitter, they can come up and say, all right, I don't want to create a username and password. I have a Twitter account. Let me log in with that. You're good to go with B2C. It is based off of Active Directory, though, so you do have all that power underneath. And it was mentioned before in Lucy's section, she mentioned authentication. You have the MCEL SDK at your disposal as well, and that's super powerful. It's crazy powerful how actually that is. So B2C, let's look at how we can hook all that up. All right, so when you do create a B2C tenant, you get actually a whole other, essentially, instance to play in. So you notice that my Azure right over here is blue top. My B2C has a black top so I can keep them separated. And what I have then is the ability to log in with my monkey finder. So this is my app to log in, and this is my API to log in with. So this is the Azure Functions, and this is the app that I'm going to log in with. So by registering those two, what I can do then is have this user flow. And so what the user flow is, essentially, is a way for me to go through and sign in. And I'm just going to say run user flow. And it allows, allows me to sign in. So I can do matt.sokup at microsoft.com. And my favorite password, ABCD1234 exclamation point, and sign in. And this directs me back. And here I get this big token back who, when you look at the claims, identifies me for who I am. See, my given name is Matt, and it tells me what I logged in at. And it even gives me an access token hash. All right. So that's B2C letting me log in and giving me back an access token that I can use to go back over into my Azure Functions and we'll go over here to Function App Settings, Authentication Authorization. What I do is I have this set up configured, advanced, and so I have this calling back to B2C. So essentially what I did, I said, all right, Azure Functions, here's the information that you know to go talk to B2C, and so when B2C does call it, it's gonna pass it this information, or when my app calls it, it's gonna pass it this information. Functions gonna say, all right, I got this information. B2C, what do you think about it? B2C says, yeah, that's good to me. And then Functions is gonna be able to return to me a token that it creates for user broker run, which down here will come back. And it's gonna give me a partition key value of user dash, user ID with all the permissions. And so that user ID is my active directory user ID. So let's actually run this here. So I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna log in. It says Monkey Finder wants to use B2C to log in. That is an iOS thing. They are protecting you from yourself there. So I'm gonna log in again. Microsoft.com, did I spell that right? We'll find out. Favorite password in the world, sign in. All right, I'm in, so I'm gonna go log in. Oh, cancel, I'm logged in. Search, do I have any favorites yet? Not yet, make favorite. Maybe not. Let's see. Make my favorite. All right, it should tell me that I made the favorite, but it's not. So we'll give it one last try. All right, it is my favorite, so I'll delete it already. All right, so I never liked Baboon anyway. Make my favorite. All right, yeah, I love you, Baboon. I love Baboon, so I'll go over here to VS Code, Browse Azure, Refresh, and you can see I have another Baboon in here, and my partition key is that. That's my user ID, and you can see in my name, document, it's just monkey name, so I really just made it whatever I wanted to. All right. So, I'm getting near time, but I'm almost done. And 
So that's B2C. But let's let's make things a little more secure, and that's what Key Vault does. So Key Vault's really for secrets management. Think connection strings. It uses Azure Active Directory on the back end, which means apps can have access, but your users or the bad people don't. So let's see this really quick in practice. And so what I have here, I'm in my Azure Functions, and if I go down to Configuration, I can see everything. And if I go to Cosmos Configuration, you'll see here it says Key Vault Reference. Well, what does that mean? If I do Advanced Edit, you see I'm using Microsoft.KeyVault, and I have this URI in there. So where my Cosmos Connection String is, it's actually reading from Key Vault here. And if I would actually go through and try to open up that URL, no dice, unauthorized, it gives me. Cool. I mean, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. So what is Key Vault all about? I go down here, and I have my connection string in the secrets portion of Key Vault, see Cosmos Connection, and I can go in here and here where it actually is. If I do show secret value, it's, it's right down there. And what's neat about this then is I can go in and I can disable it, I can set an X, expiration date, I can actually version it if I wanted to, but where it gets really, really nice is in this access policies. You see, here I am, I can get to it, but this FO Xamarin 2, that's my functions app. I was able to say, hey, functions app, you have permission to it because you're sitting on Azure. Nobody else besides me and the functions app has permission to that. Nice, right? So Cosmos connection string, totally locked down, only the Azure app, functions app, get at it. Nobody else. Nice. All right. It's stitched. We went and we stitched a bunch of different things together. CDN, storage, Cosmos, functions, Azure, AD, B2C, Key Vault. That's a lot in like 25 minutes. All the code is at that AKA MS link, monkey dash rash. And all right, Code Mill Matt, hit me on Twitter, AKA MS Office Dash Hours. I'm flipping it back over to Channel 9 Studios. We made it. Awesome, we made F it, Matt. Thank you so much. <laughs> we had two questions really quick. Um, one from a um, very handsome gentleman, James Montemagno on Twitter, ask, how much is, um, um, uh, is Cosmos DB to get started? Free, James, it's oh. free. Okay. Uh, All right, great. hold on, hold on, James. Now, if you remember way back when, there's a great podcast called the Xamarin Podcast when we introduced um, Xamarin U when it moved over to Microsoft Learn. Do you remember how much that cost? Uh, I believe it was free. It was free, it was yeah. Free. Cosmos, the same cost. Free. <laughs> same cost. That's a deal. Uh, <laughs> all right, one other question. Also, check out Matt and I um, every month on the Xamarin Podcast, xamarinpodcast.com. Um, question for Clifford asks, you know, um, App Center, um, they had a preview of Auth and Data that sort of has been um, deprecated, gone away, which now we can see how we can stitch together all these Azure parts. Any insights in the diagnostic and analytics? Because there's also kind of App Insights um, in general. Yeah, so right now, App Center has a great um, telemetry offering. And what's nice about App Center's telemetry offering is that you can export it into Application Insights. So right now, today, I'd still be using App Center's telemetry offering. So that's, that's where I go today. So that's also why I didn't touch on it right now, because App Center's telemetry is still there. Perfect. Yeah, it's used by a lot, a lot of developers, including myself <laughs> and a lot of us here, <laughs> too. So um, awesome. Well, thank you, Matt, so much for stitching it together for us. Of course, uh, make sure you hit him up at Code Mill Matt on Twitter. I'll answer more questions there. We're headed up for our last session before a final goodbye. Head back over to Olia.